Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Masick. I'm the president and CEO here at the Heinz History Center. Did you know, did you know, Max, that this was the largest history museum in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and an affiliate of the Smithsonian Institution? We're proud to today uh, have David McCullough with us. Now, David McCullough, everyone's going to say this every place he stops on his book tour, needs no introduction. But it's really true here because this is David McCullough country. Uh, some of you knew him growing up. Uh, some of you went to school with him at the Linden School or the Shadyside Academy. Most of you know him from his books. He is a storyteller par excellence. Uh, some of you joined him in 1968 uh, reading his book on the Johnstown Flood, a story that he heard as, as a boy growing up. Uh, in 1972, he wrote The Great Bridge uh, and the story of the Roebling family, a Pittsburgh family, captured the nation's imagination. And in 1977, of course, he wrote The, the Path Between the Seas, uh, uh, a, a story of engineering uh, that, well, still hasn't been equaled. And in 1981, he wrote Mornings on Horseback. It's still one of my favorite books of David McCullough's. It's the story of young Theodore Roosevelt. Now, those last two books, The Path Between the Seas and Mornings on Horseback, earned him the National Book Award. Uh, but he kept going. He wrote the inspirational stories that are found in Brave Companions in 1992. And then, of course, Truman, followed soon after by John Adams, both Pulitzer Prize winning books. Now, in, 19, uh, in, in 2005, he wrote 1776. And I like to think that maybe one of the things that inspired David to write that uh, was the, the stories he heard as a youth here in Western Pennsylvania about young George Washington and the character building and the experience that he earned here. The following year, after 2005, he uh, went to the White House to receive the uh, nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But we're here today to talk about his latest book. And I'm delighted that Pittsburgh is one of the first three cities uh, to learn about the greater journey, Americans in Paris. Uh, and I just learned today that next weekend, it will be announced in the New York Times that the greater journey is the number one bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. David McCullough is Pittsburgh's favorite son and our best ambassador. He's also America's favorite historian. Please join with me in welcoming David McCullough. I've decided after that wonderful response, I'm announcing my candidacy today. <laughs> we may not win, but we'll have a hell of a lot of fun campaigning in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a wonderful welcome. Needless to say, uh, there's no place where I'd rather be welcomed than my hometown. and. Uh, it means more to me than I, can, than I can express. And Andy, thank you very much for what you said. Uh, Pittsburgh is fortunate in many ways and uh, has been all along by people who make a difference. 
And if you were looking for an example of somebody who's made a difference in this city over the last 10 years, it, it would be Andy Masick. We have, uh, we have a job to do, all of us, to educate our children more effectively about the story of our country, our children and our grandchildren. And they're slipping behind. And this isn't just something that is my opinion. It's been shown in innumerable studies. And it's also been shown that one of the best ways to, to set things back the way they should be is for parents and grandparents to take part in bringing the story of a community, or the story of a state, the story of the country to the children and grandchildren by taking them places, taking them to Gettysburg, taking them to Washington or to the Concord Bridge or any of uh, several hundred destinations, but also to take them to great museums. And this one is, a, is a, one of the crown jewels of the country, believe me. And the fact that it now has this marvelous association partnership with the Smithsonian gives it all the more strength and importance. So the fact that people are bringing their families here and talking about what they see here and whetting their curiosity for more is the best kind of solution to the problem possible. I think to, to cut our children off from history, to, to, to uh, act as though that isn't important, is not only uh, very bad judgment for all kinds of reasons, uh, for their capacity as citizens, for example, but also the pleasure of history. And it would be as if we said, well, we're, we're going to deny them any music in their life, or we're going to deny them uh, art or the theater in life. Uh, and uh, the, the pleasure, the love of learning, is a lifelong part of life, as I'm sure many of you heartily agree. One of the lessons of, uh, of history and of life, obviously, is that very little of consequence is ever accomplished alone. And a book is no exception, believe me. This new book of mine, which has my name emblazoned across the cover, is really in many ways misleading because by no means is this my work alone. The uh, production value of this particular edition of the book is of the highest quality I think I've ever seen for any of my, not only just my books, but any book. And uh, the, the design uh, talent that went into it, the, the care about the reproduction of the color illustrations, all of that was only made possible by extremely professional, conscientious people with my publisher, Simon & Schuster. And then there are all the people who helped me understand what I needed to know in order to write the book. Uh, in Paris and, in, and here uh, at great collections of American archival material, letters and diaries that I worked with, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, Yale University, Harvard, 36 different uh, institutions of one kind or another, which all uh, didn't just supply the material for me to work with, but the material was advised or amplified by people who work there, who know the material, who know uh, its importance or its value, or the fact that nobody's really looked carefully at it. 200 letters, for example, by, written by Ag Gussie St. Gaudens, Augustus St. Gaudens, the wife of Augustus St. Gaudens, the great sculptor. 200 of her letters, vivid descriptions of their life in Paris when they were first married and moved there, uh, which were all uh, at, the, at the Dartmouth Library in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, and very often it's the secondary characters who tell you the, the insight, give you the insight, tell you the, give you the descriptions, tell you about a character or about an event in a way that, that major characters don't, just as it sometimes happens in a play or a movie. And then there was my family who all helped, but most important of all was my editor-in-chief, who is also my wife, Rosalie. <laughs> And I believe in writing for the ear as well as the eye. I, I find that that, and many of you I'm sure have done the same thing. If you read something you've written out loud, 
you hear things that need to be straightened out that you might not notice with the eye, particularly if you've been looking at the same page or pages day after day for months. And um, by listening to it being read aloud has been uh, Im immensely helpful to me. And Rosalie's done that with all my books, everything I've ever written, uh, often in two, three, four drafts right down to the final uh, galleys of the book. And she's, uh, she gives me big words. <laughs> she's much better speller than I am. And uh, we have a family of uh, five children, 18 grandchildren. She's um, mission control, <laughs> and secretary of the treasury, <laughs> and maybe most important of all, chair of the ethics committee. <laughs> and she is the star I steer by in life, and I want, to, I want her to just stand up and everybody see you. Rosalie. Uh, thank you. I want to start off by reading you a passage uh, written by one of the characters in the book, which may seem a very strange thing to begin talking about a book about Americans in Paris. This was uh, an account written by Augustus St. Gaudens, the great sculptor, of, uh, of life as he knew it when he was 13 years old, a uh, street kid growing up in New York. He was the son of a, an immigrant shoemaker. It's a great American story. His father came from France, that part down the south of France near the Pyrenees, and his mother was Irish, and they came over from Ireland uh, at the time of the potato famine. Augustus St. Gaudens was born in Ireland, but as, as an infant, they were, he was brought over and he grew up in New York. And here's what he wrote about how days became. He was working, he'd been put to work at 13 years old and would work for the rest of his life. And he was working for a cameo cutter uh, the little brooches and so forth that were very popular with, with men and women at the time. And it was uh, a sweatshop, and he was worked extremely hard. I became a terrific worker, he would remember, toiling every night until 11 o'clock. And after class was over, he went to took, took art drawing lessons afterward in the conviction that in me another heaven-born genius had been given to the world. He already had this conviction. Indeed, I became so exhausted with the confining work of cameo cutting by day and drawing at night that in the morning, mother literally dragged me out of bed, pushed me over to the washstand where I gave myself a cat's lick somehow or other, drove me to the seat at the table, administered my breakfast, which consisted of tea and large quantities of long French loaves of bread with butter, and tumbled me downstairs out into the street where I awoke. <laughs> <laughs> now there's several things going on there, it seems to me, that are very notable. One is the use of the language. He's a superb writer, tumbled me down the stairs. And this is a boy, young man, who never went to school. And this I found to be true with several of the characters that I have included in the book who did not go to college, not go to high school and yet they wrote wonderfully. And uh, it's a bit humbling because you think, well, how did they learn to write so well? Well, one of the reasons they learned to write so well was they all wrote letters. It was part of life. You were expected to write letters. And they kept diaries. They, they knew how to work their thoughts out on paper. The other thing is that I think is wonderful is that when he gets down the street, tumbled me downstairs on, on, into the street where I awoke. In many ways, this is a metaphor for what will happen to these young people when they get to Paris, they will awake. They will awake as they never knew they to be awake, the experience of being awake to that degree. Now those that I've chosen to write about are all young people, with very few exceptions, all young people who had exceptional talent or they were told they had exceptional talent. And they knew, perhaps more than their parents or others appreciated, that maybe they had talent, but that their talent could not become greater, stronger, unless they had the proper training. 
And even if they had the proper training, the only way to find out if they were really good was to be where there were a lot of really good people, where the competition was there, where they could see, am I, am I, do I have it? Now, they went for a variety of reasons. Some went to study medicine because Paris was the medical capital of the world and American medicine was woefully behind, primitive. They went to study architecture because there were no schools of architecture in the United States. They went to study with great painters because there were no ateliers, there were no studios where a young, talented person could go and study with a painter. Some of them went for ideas. They simply wanted to, to know more. And the prime example of that was Charles Sumner, who was both a graduate of Harvard and of the Harvard Law School and was practicing law for about three years in Boston when he realized, I, I just don't know enough. So he went over to attend lectures at the Sorbonne. Now at the time, one could go to the Sorbonne or go to the Ecole de Médecine, the great medical school in Paris, for nothing if you were a foreigner, which Americans, of course, were. Imagine a country with a policy like that. So once they got there, all they really had to pay for was their, uh, their room and board, as it were. And when they discovered that wine was cheaper than milk, uh, <laughs> it was a very appealing kind of surprise about the room and board. <laughs> they worked exceedingly hard, all of them. They worked in many cases, uh, in most cases, harder than they ever had in their lives, before or since. And I think part of the, the message that comes through from their their writing about the experience, both then and afterward in retrospect, is that it vitiates the notion that the commercial ballyhoo of our time would have us believe that ease and happiness are necessarily synonymous. Uh, they found that in work you love, there is a happiness that surpasses anything. And so they would often refer to it afterward in, for years as the happiest time of their lives. None of them that I know of quit and went home feeling, I don't like it, I can't do it, or this isn't what I expected. And, it, and most admirable in that respect were the medical students because what they went through was as difficult a routine, as difficult a, um, a test of one's physical and intellectual stamina as I know of. Keep in mind that almost none of them, uh, very, very few exceptions, none of them spoke a word of French when they arrived because French was not yet taught. None of the modern European languages were yet taught in Europe. Now this is in the 1830s, 1840s on up till 1900. 